please welcome to the stage President, ABC Sales, Jerry Wong. Great. I thought the last panel was so interesting and so great to hear from all the creative minds across our networks and embracing change and how they craft story and how they're telling their story and how they're engaging our viewers. There's no question that the networks represented here today are pushing the envelope on the very best, the most creative storytelling. You've heard it said a few times this afternoon, and I completely agree. agree. There's never been better content, and in my opinion, since all of my career. So if you stop to think about the value proposition, the creative renaissance is just the beginning. This panel, and we've got the sexy panel, is focused on what ultimately is driving your business and how collectively the network offering ultimately, again, drives your bottom line. So there are three things that we're going to focus on today and the three things that really matter. One, understanding the totality and the actual audience delivery of what's being offered. Two, factoring in how engagement and quality drive ROI. And three, as media becomes more complex and data becomes more prevalent, how do we assign attribution? So we're all hyper-focused on a lot of these issues. And in fact, I think the broadcast networks have provided real thought leadership in a lot of these areas. And there are a lot of layers to the conversation. And I think today that we have this incredibly thoughtful group of colleagues to, you know, here to talk about their perspective. So we have Eric Cardinal from the CW. We have David Poltrak from CBS. Audrey Steele representing Fox. And Alan Wurzel from NBC. So Alan, let's start with you. There are a number of misperceptions about broadcast television's <laughs> size of audience. How big is the gap of what's being measured and what's really being viewed? Well, funny you should ask. Okay. I have my spontaneous remarks right here. No, it's interesting. You know, the earlier panel, almost every person there expressed some frustration with respect to the metrics. And, you know, we're a business of metrics. We, we transact on the metrics. We evaluate our shows on the metrics. And the problem is these metrics are beginning to fail us. They're beginning to create some very serious misperceptions, urban myths, if you will. And I think one of the biggest ones is that people aren't watching TV anymore like they used to. Well, it's not that viewers have stopped watching. It's that we've stopped measuring. And that's the problem. So I'm a research guy. I come with slides. Take a look at this first chart. Oh, I've got to pull out the uh, excuse me, research guy with clicker. OK. Um, this is Nielsen. These are Nielsen ratings, and it's a five-year track, okay, and it's broken out by demographics. If you looked at this track, what you would say is that the viewing, this is the, this is the putt, it's not, you know, what they watch, it's using the medium, over the past five years has gone down 17% for 18 to 24s, down 15%, 25 to 34s, down 5%, 35 to 49, and, you know, basically 50 pluses have remained a little stable, maybe up a little bit. But here's the deal. Anybody that's worked in this business knows that putts and huts move glacially. When you see double-digit changes, you know that something's going on. And we know what's going on. And that's the fact that people are consuming this video content on platforms that are not being integrated into the Nielsen currency metric. Take a look at this slide. What it shows you basically, it may be a little tough to read. The blue is what is in the Nielsen currency, and the yellow is what Nielsen isn't measuring. And so the way to read this is this, that if you look at the 18 to 24-year-olds, you're going to see that Nielsen reports they're watching about 27 and a half hours, you know, average total weekly. But the fact of the matter is, when you add in what Nielsen isn't measuring, you really go up to about, uh, let's take a look here about 29 hours, it's a 30% increase. Same thing when it comes to 25 to 34s, it's a 23% increase. 35 to 49s, it's a 12% increase. In fact, the reality is that if you take a look at those numbers there and you add them to what I showed you earlier, rather than having that double digit decline among the younger viewers, what you find is actually a 7.5% increase in viewing among these younger guys. But let me be even more specific and show you a couple of program examples that teaches you the fact that right now, when it comes to ratings, what you see is not what you get. 
And I'll start with The Blacklist, okay? It's, it's our big show. It's a very, very broad mainstream program. And the day after the show airs, on average, this is from last season, we get a 2.9 live same-day rating. If you wait five days, that rating goes up because of time-shifted viewing to a 4.5. And then it takes 20 days, but 20 days later, the L7 rating, which includes all the time-shifting from day of air, takes that to a 4.9. But as Billy Mays, the infomercial guy, used to say, that's not all, because if you add the following things, and um, I know it's a little tough to read from the chart, so I'll just tell you. If you add the consumption on VOD days 4 to 7, DVR days 8 to 15, out of home, PC and laptop, tablet, smartphone, game consoles where you can stream over-the-top devices like Apple or Roku, smart or connected TVs, and Blu-ray devices. And what we did was we cobbled together from various sources what we know that measurement to be, what you add really is one full rating point. And that's 17% of the consumption of that show during, you know, during that time that basically isn't being considered. And think of it this way. What Nielsen tells us with all of this Live 7 is that about 16.9 million viewers watch the show. But the fact of the matter is, that one rating point, or 17%, adds another 3 million viewers. 3 million, and that's not shabby. And here's the deal. This is a mainstream program. It's not, you know, a show that skews very young to digital natives, you know, 25-year-olds who wear black and, and, and live in Williamsburg. This is America, and we're losing 3 million people. But we're an ecumenical conference, right? So let me, oh, by the way, it takes you to a 5.9 rating. Let me move on to just some of my colleagues' programs. The same exact situation, although even a larger percentage, takes place with The Vampire Diaries. 32% of the viewing, a full third, isn't being considered when you look at the currency number. And one more example, Fox's New Girl, again, it's 36%. 1.6 rating points just disappears. These people are there. And by the way, they're not watching clips. They're watching the same program as folks who are watching it on the big screen TV. Now, I can go on and on, but I won't. I'm sure you'll agree, though, that when you get to these double-digit percentages that we just sort of lose, I mean, this gets to be really serious stuff. And by the way, the changes in technology and the changes in the evolution and the way people are using that technology only continue. So if we come back a year from now, I can guarantee you those numbers will increase. So, that's my story. I'm sticking to it. Turn it back to Jerry. But wait, there's more. You heard Dana Walden say it earlier in the uh, previous panel. The trend's already begun, right, with the premiere of last week's uh, episodes at uh, our own network. Uh, How to Get Away with Murder added 6 million additional DVR viewers in just the first three days. Okay, so that's a lot of incremental viewership. And then you add in, right, Talon's point the streaming and all of the other devices, and a lot of it is outside the C window. So that's ROI that ultimately, again, you get the benefit from, and as Alan just said, it's going to grow, right? Time shifting is going to expand. So the networks, and we've talked about it all afternoon, right? We're hyper-focused on changing and improving measurement, and we have to be able to better understand and capture, right, the on-demand consumption, what's happening online, and obviously what's happening in app. And so again, fair to say that this is a, 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 a big consideration for all of us, but still there are gaps that have to be addressed. So Audrey, can you talk about some of the challenges you know, you're, you're facing with uh, your programming? Um, well, I think that one of the, uh, as Alan outlined, the, the problem with Nielsen measurement is the strict currency rules that are in place mean that what gets to be included um, is increasingly limited and, and does it match up with the way that our viewership plays out over time. Um, and also because of the flexibility that we require um, as, as programmers to commercialize nonlinear viewing because of those strict currency rules, um, it, the, the currency is really just not up to, to speed in terms of being able to convey um, the totality of our audience and the health, really, the continued health of our business. Um, a, a good case in point is the, the recent just this Monday, in fact, launch of Nielsen Mobile TV ratings. There was, you know, much 
fanfare and, and uh, you know, singing and that kind of thing. Um, because we've been waiting for it for a long time. There are a lot of false starts with the introduction of mobile TV ratings. But the reality is that although it's a great step by Nielsen in the right direction to capture this viewing within television ratings and to enable us to, you know, at the very least, of course, to monetize, but also to improve the optics of, of the rating that gets reported, um, it still leaves a very significant portion of the, the viewing that happens on our mobile apps out of the rating. And so it's an imperfect solution for us and for you, an imperfect solution for representing the audience and an imperfect solution for monetizing that audience. And in fact, it requires us to then you know, have a, a separate sales effort um, with digital currency that is in itself fairly imperfect because it, it really only recently started to properly represent demographic viewing on mobile apps. Um, another problem, of course, is over the top. You know, while we've been waiting, and, and you know, earlier, maybe two years ago, when I think Nielsen was first putting into place plans to measure and include mobile, um, you know, we, we thought this is the next big thing, but actually over the top has been a much bigger um, viewing phenomenon with digital that's really eclipsed mobile, and Nielsen really doesn't have any, any plans on the horizon for including viewing that's outside of that, that three-day window. Um, and so, I mean, one of, the, one of the solutions, of course, is to extend the measurement, the viewing window. And so I, I very much thank all of our clients, many in this room, who did C7 deals with us. But of course, that's not the only solution. And we really need to push forward to advance the measurement so that we can capture you know, the, to the totality of viewing and also advance our business practices so that, you know, that you're benefiting from these large audiences that we're still delivering. OK, thank you. Eric, your thoughts? Well, I mean, uh, you know, we have, uh, we, we have a slightly uh, more specialized issue, I guess. The issue itself is not so different. We share all the same concerns as the people here on the stage. Um, but really, Alan's set of slides indicate, and, and you could have inferred it, uh, uh, our special challenge, which is that young viewers, uh, the CW audience in part, are simply the ones who are the least likely to watch television content in a um, measured situation. Uh, they, 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 are, they are the ones who are most likely missed by Nielsen. So a little history. CW started out in 2006. It was sort of the cusp of a revolution. Uh, digital distribution expanded. Our young target audience went for it in a big way. Um, very quickly, we saw a viewing of our most popular shows, Supernatural, Gossip Girl back then, a little later, uh, Vampire Diaries, uh, moving to computers and subsequently to other digital platforms uh, that Nielsen was unequipped to measure. Uh, but we knew, no matter whether it was going to be measured or not at the outset, we had to deliver that content to these viewers wherever they wanted it, whenever they wanted it. Um, so we actually, early on, 2007, I'd say, went to Nielsen and said, OK, well, well um, make us your beta testers. We know the world has changed. We know people are watching totally differently or, or starting to watch very differently than they used to. Um, and, and let us be your guinea pigs for, for developing techniques to capture, capture this viewing. Uh, we called this, it was the end of the Bush administration, so this was no viewer left behind. And, and, and uh, Nielsen went about uh, designing a dashboard to, to generate cross-platform reports and integrate all this great data that, of course, they didn't really have. Um, so they had no digital data, essentially, to populate the system, and it kind of fell by the wayside before anybody ever, ever heard about it. Um, and, you know, as Alan and Audrey both observed, they're still pretty far from, from, from that goal of an integrated system. So as, as many of you probably know, our response, you know, and others in the industry, was to develop proprietary systems uh, to bring viewers the programming they want with the messaging that, that many people in this audience uh, uh, need and develop metrics that the whole industry accepted. So in, in the years since uh, CW Convergence, which was our, our moniker for, has been in the marketplace, we've had great success delivering our episodic streaming with full ad loads um, on computer, tablet, mobile phones, and, and over the top, and our clients have accepted our digital impressions as equivalent of on air. But from the perspective of the industry as a whole, you know, that's really not good enough. As Audrey notes, Nielsen still can't provide cross-platform measurement nor really any sorts of planning or analytic tools we have for linear television. And don't even ask about transparency, because um, nobody knows what the, other, you know, what the other guys are doing exactly. Um, now, Nielsen understands these issues, and they do have some lofty goals and some pretty aggressive timelines, including mobile OCR, um, which I'm not sure that any network is yet actually uh, uh, participating in, but, but we will soon. Um, 
But those of us who work in the trenches with Nielsen, work with them uh, every day, you know, know how really difficult, I mean, to, to give Nielsen its due, this is, these are genuinely difficult challenges, but we also know how long it takes and, and how much Nielsen struggles to meet them. So at the CW, we're gonna continue to work closely with them to address these problems. But as we did with Convergence, uh, we'll develop our own solutions where Nielsen, where Nielsen uh, uh, can't come up with anything, work with anyone who has a, a good idea or an innovative idea to try to fill in the gaps and, and connect the dots. Okay, thank you. So a lot of work to be done. And again, the collective might of how the industry goes forward is you know, absolutely <coughs> being discussed. And in partnership, we'll figure it out together. So this notion of extended audiences ex is extremely pronounced right inside the broadcast environment. We know that quality drives viewership and therefore then there's this engagement and, and seeking out and all that behavior right for that on-demand environment. So I wanna pursue a little bit more the engagement thread and it's really about the entire experience. It's linear, it's digital, it's social and it's your advertising in that environment. You're welcome advertising in that environment. So David, You've been at the forefront of developing very sophisticated, sophisticated ways to tie ad spend back to sales results. And you've got some new research that you'd like to share with us that correlates high quality programming back to actual sales impact. So what's the latest headline? Thank you, Jerry. So uh, first thing I have to clarify something that whenever I'm on panels like this that follow the uh, showrunners, they always say, well, now we've heard from the creative side, now we're gonna talk numbers. Uh, who is more creative in this business <laughs> than the network research department, right? So a little creativity for you. I'm, I'm excited about this panel because ROI measuring skill against sales, I've actually been waiting over 40 years for this. So, uh, so let me get start with a little history for you. So throughout the history of television and advertising, the networks have always been challenged by their clients uh, to demonstrate the effectiveness of the media in terms of return on investment, as opposed to audience terms. The, the networks have responded by funding two major studies, How Advertising Works and How Advertising Works Too. Those studies made a strong case for network advertising. However, they were one-off studies. Uh, they covered myriad brand, brands and campaigns. But what the advertisers were truly seeking was a way to correctly attribute and measure the ROI for their campaigns on an ongoing basis. In the past, the research and analytical resources were not, able, not available to provide this continuous form of ROI measurement. Today, as new digital players are touting their measurement and targeting capabilities, single source database suppliers and marketing analytic providers are making it possible for the networks to offer the type of granular ROI accounting that the advertisers have been seeking. We, are now, we, we now have available to us the ability also to do A, B, control test experiments through the implementation of digital ad insertion. This this afternoon, I'd like to introduce to you a, con a, a new concept called the Campaign Performance Audit, or CPA, which we have named it in recognition of the accountants and procurement specialists that are continually demanding that we show them the money. Over the past five years, CBS has been working with Nielsen Catalina Solutions, Nielsen Buyer, Nielsen Buyer Insights, and TRA to develop an effective way to provide granular ROI measurement for television advertising campaigns. As a result of that work, we have developed the CPA template. The first major product of our work focused on the re-examination of the original finding from how advertising works concerning the long-term <laughs> ROI of television advertising. In that study, the long-term effect of television advertising was found to double the short-term effect. That rule of thumb, surprisingly, done, developed in the 1980s, has been fairly universally applied since that time. Working with Nielsen and Kellogg's, we were able to use the new single source databases to measure the long-term ROI for Kellogg's and some other CBG, CPG products. 
What we found was a range of results with the average well above two times and the Kellogg's brand at 3.5 instead of two. The ARF and CRE are now developing large-scale projects focused on long-term advertising effects. Our next investigation also brought us back to a major industry collaboration, how advertising works too. One of the findings of that 1995 study that included 800 brands across 200 different product categories and covered all sales in over 4,000 outlets was that television schedules that had a dispersion of weight across the three components of broadcast prime time, cable, and broadcast non-prime time delivered superior ROI results to, schedule, to schedules with a, sit, with a high concentration of weight in any of those three components. Our attention was drawn to this research because we have not, our attention was drawn to this research because we have now seen many CPG advertisers reducing their broadcast prime advertising weight to marginal levels and in some cases eliminating it from the mix entirely. From 2000 to 2014, broadcast prime went from 40% to just 22% of the collective spending of the $10 million plus CPG categories. Now I know you're probably saying that that's because there are now so many more successful original cable series. Yes, I am sure that does account for a portion of the shift. But that is not where most of the money is going. It is instead going to the wholesale purchasing of the lowest cost and lowest rated available television time. We decided to use the new advanced single source sources available through Nielsen Catalina, Catalina Solutions and measure the relative ROI for the individual components of these schedules to see if advertisers are using the medium to its full effectiveness. Or if the 1995 finding has held true and the elimination or marginalization of high rated top prime time programs from the mix was reducing the television ROI for these bargain hunting CPG advertisers. We have now conducted a series of different tests and in all cases we have found that broadca the broadcast prime component of the schedules delivered by far the highest ROI and the excessive volume of low rated spots undermined the overall return for these advertisers. It is not that these low rated spots do not deliver a positive return. All forms of television advertising usually deliver a positive return. After all, if these low rated spots did not work at all, then the, then the direct response advertisers would not to continue to use them as they do today. It's just that these advertisers are overusing this form of television well beyond its, the point of diminishing return and underusing the high return premium broadcast primetime alternative. A typical large budget CPG brand in our test had several hundred low rated non-prime spots with an average household rating of 0.2 running each week versus a handful or in some cases no primetime spots. When you hear about this high volume low rating exchange style television advertising approach today, you immediately think of programmatic buying. But this is not true programmatic buying. There is no sign that they, at any effective targeting is used to select the spots to run. We rated the compo this component of the, of the sample schedules out against the actual user profiles and we found that collectively they did not, they did not over deliver and often under delivered on these key usage based target metrics. On the other hand, we found that a few, that, that the few broadcast primetime spots utilized usually produced indexes from 110 to 125 against these key usage parameters. It is hard to believe that advertisers 
that are buying two to four hundred spots a week, over 50 to 60 networks, are employing any targeting at all. However, even if they were, at the 0.2 rating level, the statistical error would overwhelm the indexing precision. A 200 index would be statistically the same as a 50 index. When these advertisers had their periods of significant, had their periods of significant broadcast primetime activity, we were able to produce an, a re, an ROI for each component of the schedule. In every case, the broadcast primetime component, though substantially more expensive than on a CPM basis, produced a greater ROI than the other components of the schedule. The broadcast prime spots also expanded the weekly reach among the target user demographic and better concentrated the frequency of exposure in the effective frequency range. These findings confirm the 1995 study regarding the superior return from schedules with dispersion across multiple television options and with a significant share of the weight on a weekly basis coming from high-rated primetime programs. The only difference that changed environment has made is that the original high-rated programs are now more prevalent on cable television than they were back then. Of course, that's not where these advertisers are getting their, with, that's not what these advertisers are getting with their lowest CPM carpet bombing approach. The full campaign performance audit is a five-step process. It begins by measuring and making sure that you have the right message. It then measures the concept of reach. Reach not only for the campaign, but reach by week and market penetration. Third, it looks at the frequency distribution to see if the campaign stacks up against the recency concept of obtaining the closest proximity between each consumer's last exposure to an ad and the purchase occasion, both in absolute terms and relative to the competition. Fourth, we have a measure of how effectively does it reach the tar and efficiently does it reach the target audience. And this is a target that can now be defined in precise purchaser profile terms, as opposed to the increasingly inappropriate age gender demographic terms. Finally, it also, we can now also measure the context of each ad. Does context matter? A plethora of research says it does. Today, service, service, services such as Nielsen's brand effects can measure the, and, and determine the right context for each type of ad. But the context is changing. It's being enhanced by social media and by the interaction now possible due to the fact that two-thirds of the viewers are simultaneously online while watching TV. This is truly the golden age, I believe, for broadcast primetime television. And with our campaign performance uh, audit, we think we'll be able to demonstrate to you that primetime television is where to be. Thank you. As Joanne said, OMG. Mm. So we can have the one-on-ones for your CPAs not just the CPG category. Okay, David, wow. <laughs> Those tools, um, amazing stuff. Uh, they're going to be available, right? We're, all of us are, are Nielsen partners and obviously a great opportunity for our advertisers. So for the group, this latest ROI development and the work that's been done seems to close the loop even more, right? When you're tying in quality engagement and sales impact, which is what ultimately everybody cares about. And as the media landscape gets more complicated, even more complicated than it already is, right, we're going to think about how we enhance how we think about attribution. What is happening the top of the funnel, through the funnel, you know, to that actual purchase moment. So we can start, Alan, with you. What are the key challenges in that next step for building out a bigger, better attribution model? You know, I, I, it's, 
I don't, I think, you know, I'm really impressed with the stuff that David presented because I think it's, a, it's clearly a roadmap and it's tools that we can use now. But I think it's sort of one size won't fit all. I mean, I, I really believe that one of the things that we're trying to do, and I think my colleagues as well, is to work with advertisers to sort of find out what is the kind of ROI that you feel is important to measure and then, and then sort of measure it. I think we're all confident enough in the, in the business that we're in, and that is broadcast television, that we're willing to prove to you that you're smart to put your money and your resources you know, into broadcast television and to demonstrate that it was a really good choice. So you know, rather than be specific, because I can't be, I just think the point of the matter is that you know, we're in a position right now using all these tools and hopefully you know, some of the things that'll be coming down the road. I mean, you know, I'm, I'm a big advocate of SIM, which is the organization that's trying to uh, develop new ways of measuring media. And you know, we do a lot of work to try to give the industry you know, at least some tools or see the ability to develop some of the tools to measure this. So you know, I, I think that you guys shouldn't be shy in asking us to demonstrate the fact that by putting money where you know, we are, that you're going to get results. And I think that we're now in a position to sort of demonstrate that empirically. OK, thank you. David, something you'd like to add? Yeah, so the attribution modeling is, uh, is, is definitely something of great potential for us. Uh, unfortunately, when, when internet search came along and internet advertising came along, and particularly internet search came along, uh, what you had was uh, you had simplistic models being used, uh, uh, marketing mix models being used, and people started to use uh, search, and they, they got sales results, and these models were attributing the entire result to search. And then as models got more sophisticated and people recognized, people began to recognize, well, actually what search was doing was really making television advertising more effective. And because the person who was now stimulated, made aware and stimulated by a, an advertisement on television, could now go someplace and immediately find out about it. And so the, 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 the pro, over half the people in the US have, say, in survey, when, when surveyed, will say that they have, del, they have gone to search something because they've seen it, a television ad. A television ad has actually started the process, initiated the process that ended in search. So the more sophisticated modelers now are moving to a new generation of models, and these models are called process-based models. They're designed, they're much, it's much more complicated to do, but they, they, they follow the entire process, the path to purchase, as they call it, process. And these models hold the promise of being able to, to look across all platforms across uh, online and interactive and television and, put, and, and radio and put the entire picture together. And I'm, I'm very encouraged by the work that's being done in that area. And again, both ARF and uh, CRE are, are working uh, in an in a collaborative industry way uh, to help uh, move this along. Okay. Well, and I, I think that the, the next logical step for a lot of these process-based modelers, and we've actually worked with a few um, ourselves to demonstrate the impact that television has, not just in its own right, but the way that it influences other media in the purchase funnel um, that needs to be accurately and properly attributed. We, we think that the, that the next logical step in that is to be able to build in attribution for all of the kinds of precision buying that many of you are doing. We recognize that our clients are you know, under the gun, uh, pressured to cut costs and to build in you know, uh, data-driven solutions and to automate um, in ways that have you, you know, looking for very, very highly hyper-targeted opportunities. Um, and that the way that the current media environment exists, what that means is that the arguably the, the worst possible media environment, you know, non-premium, um, digital video and, and digital display environments are probably the best um, opportunity for, for very precisely targeting you know, the, the consumers that you're looking for. Um, and so what we, really, what we need to do as a next step and what we hope to work with many of you to do as a next step with these attribution models is to 
to sort of suss out the value of environment. You know, we like to say that, in, that quality environment trumps precision, um, and we need to really be able to prove that out until such time that television can be, can be more competitive in delivering both, the, you know, the value of an immersive, uh, an immersive environment in delivering long-term brand equity like Dave's study um, and vast amount of work proved, um, until such time as we can marry that with actual precise targeting, you know, we need to, to be able to prove out that, this, that these environments are still valuable and more valuable in, you know, in building brands than the, you know, the non-premium video environments that many of you are buying. Okay. So maybe it's an opportunity, right, to establish best practices and actually work together, right? So, uh, again, in combination, Everybody showed up today, right? The five networks are here and present. And I think there's a willingness to really focus in on what the industry initiative should be and could be. So that's really all we have today. And, and I guess I can um, end with what we uh, started with from the very, very top of the afternoon, which is the great content, right? It's the magnet for engagement. And ROI is a direct result of that engagement. So it's clear we have a lot of work to do in research, and we've got to invest uh, more in measurement. We truly need to understand what's seen, what's bought, the path to purchase, and again, building out a more complete attribution model. So thank you very much, panelists, for participating, uh, for joining us today. I think this discussion has been a good launch pad for the next uh, uh, panel, which is focus in on innovation and how the networks are doubling down to drive even more uh, viewer engagement. And if you're just loving uh, the afternoon and everything that you're hearing, uh, I've been given a message that you can be tweeting out hashtag videonomics. Thank you very much, everybody.